Hello, good morning. This is Dr. Eric Bricker, and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's training session is on success, success stories in healthcare finance. Now, so the first one, I'm going to go into more detail around the company that I founded, Compass Professional Health Services, and how and our successes that we had in healthcare navigation. And this is not meant to be some sort of like pat on your back sort of thing. I mean, at the end of the day, we were just super fortunate to be able, you know, we were kind of in the right place at the right time to be able to, to help these folks. And I just wanted to show you kind of how the voice versus exit manifested itself at, uh, at Compass. So Compass, as I mentioned, it was tools and support for healthcare consumers. It took the form of a personal healthcare concierge where our, we call them a health pro, and you would interact with your health phone by phone or by email. Um, and we, you know, we had an app as well. You could do some self-service looking up uh, things as well. And you would get your Compass Navigation service through your job. And so you'd have your medical, your dental, your vision insurance, and then you would have your Compass Health Pro to help you navigate all those. And our Compass Health Pros were basically like uh, administrative experts. We didn't do any clinical decision-making. I mean, that was between the doctor and the patient. But for all the, the morass and quagmire of healthcare, that's what we were experts in. And what would, let me give you the specific examples. Okay, here's the success. You're like, okay, fine. Here, these are true stories. Okay. Now, we had a, a member in Florida who was like the 20 year old daughter of, of the employee of a municipality. It was a very large uh, county, you know, big self funded employer in Florida. And so this 20 year old daughter was still on the plan. She went to community college and she had a part-time job and she had a condition called gastroparesis where food, where her stomach didn't move the food along. It didn't empty into her small intestine. So the food would get backed up. And when that happens, you get nauseous, you throw, as, as you can imagine, you throw up a lot and you lose weight. And it's incredibly painful because your stomach gets really distended. And when your stomach gets distended, it's very painful. So she's in this constant abdominal pain. It's like a miserable existence. And she had a local gastroenterologist that she had been, been seen for this. And he had her on like 12 medications. And this had been going on for like three years and it, it, it wouldn't get any better. And she had been to the ER like eight or nine times. She'd been like hospitalized like three or four times. And it was really affecting the entire family. She had to drop out of college. She had to uh, quit her job. I mean, it was a disaster. And so um, her dad initially contacted us and then we worked with this young woman. And it turned out that in there's a Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, and the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida specifically has a gastroparesis outpatient program where you go and, you know, you have to like stay in a local hotel, but you see their multidisciplinary gastroparesis team like every day for six weeks. And it's like, it's not only a gastroenterologist, but it's also a pain management doctor. And it's also a psychologist and a psychiatrist as well, because you're outside of your nervous system, your digestive system actually has the second highest concentration of neurons or nerves in your body. And so your thoughts and your emotion and your nervous system actually has a huge impact on your digestive tract. And so between or among those three specialists, and over the course of that six weeks, they were able to get her from like the 12 medications literally down to two and her symptoms dramatically improved. And she was able to go back home and she was able to restart junior college and she was able to go back to her job. And so the punchline is, is that our health pros would actually travel for like open enrollment meetings or like wellness, you know, vendor fairs or whatever to the employer. So one of our uh, health, our health pro for, because we assigned health pros so that they had a relationship. So you had the same person working with you. And this health pro went to the county uh, wellness fair and the father was there too. And he came up and he was like literally almost in tears. And he told the health pro this story about his family and his daughter. And he said, not only has this changed my daughter's life, but it's, a, it's, it's changed our entire family because when you have a sick member of your family, like it affects the entire family unit. So it dramatically changed the husband and the wife and the other siblings' lives as well. So, I mean, just huge success personally for that woman and her family. Okay, next up. So anyway, 
long story short, too, the punchline there is, is there are absolutely pockets of excellence within American healthcare. I mean, arguably, what she got in Jacksonville, she might have not been able to get like anywhere else in the world. I mean, it was awesome. So the, it, the point is, is that there are absolutely pockets of some of the best care you can possibly imagine. We're incredibly fortunate in this country to be able to have these pockets. The challenge is, is getting to them and getting the care and then not having the billing be a disaster and financial ruin afterwards. And guess what? That's possible. It's totally possible. Okay, next up. Ophthalmology CPT code. So this is, so just very briefly, there's this thing called medical policy and medical policy means that you have, it's an, it's an actual term. It means you have health insurance, but, and the medical policy is all the buts and all the buts are things like, oh, or specifically a lot of times they're coding related, which is like, okay, if you have this particular diagnosis code, you can only bill for these particular CPT codes with that diagnosis code. And that's exactly what happened in this ophthalmologic example where a, a, pay, a member of ours had uh, a, an in-office um, laser retina uh, treatment by the ophthalmologist, but that, that laser uh, retina treatment is only approved for certain diagnosis codes. Uh, it's not by approved, I mean, approved by the insurance company for payment, not clinically approved. I mean, it was totally within the like recommendations and the guidelines of the ophthalmologist for them to do this laser procedure for this per person's retinopathy. And they, because the, the uh, ophthalmologist built a particular diagnosis code with the particular laser CPT code, the insurance denied it. They said, you can't bill. Yes, we'll cover that CPT code. Yes, we'll cover that diagnosis code, but we don't cover the two together. You can't, we don't pay for that CPT code with that diagnosis code. And the ophthalmologist was like, really? <laughs> and of course, anytime the phys any physician or doctor doesn't get paid, they just bill the patient. Like the knee-jerk reaction is just to bill the patient. So of course, the patient got the bill from the ophthalmologist and it was it was like low thousands. I'm going to say it was like $1,300. And they, they contacted us, right? So that was the reason why we got involved. And so the problem is, it was lots of problems with medical policy, but one of the problems with medical policy is that it's highly inconsistent across carriers. So that particular carrier might have had an issue with that diagnosis code and that CPT code, but other carriers have no problems with that at all. Another specific example of that is for pulmonary function tests or PFTs. You go into this like um, almost looks like a telephone booth and you breathe into it. It measures your lung volumes and you use it for sort of the diagnosis and staging of COPD and asthma. And there are like specifically... For this one blue cross plan that we were looking for, they would, and it's it's a it's a it's a series of CPT codes. This one blue cross plan that we worked for only paid for two of the CPT codes, whereas other blue cross plans in the Blue Cross Association would pay for all four. And it's like, well, why would only one blue cross plan pay for two and the other blue cross plans pay for four? It was like rather indiscriminate. And so if you happen to be on that one blue cross plan that only paid for the two, like you would get balanced billed for the other two from the pulmonologist. So anyway, we went back and you can go through the appeals process and guess what? When you go through the appeals process, there's first level appeals, guess what? Almost every single first level appeal gets denied. So like we just do it because you know you gotta do it. So nobody should ever stop after a first level appeal. Like that's like a guaranteed denial. Like you, like it, first level appeals like shouldn't even exist because it's just basically an automatic denial. Okay, then there's second level appeals. And there's third level appeals, okay? So you can do third, three levels of appeals and the third level appeal even happen, has to happen through arbitration outside of the insurance company itself. And so because we had expertise in the appeals process, then we could run through that. And all you have to do is provide the clinical documentation and have the, the ophthalmology medical director at the insurance company look at it. And they're like, yeah, that's actually standard of care. Like, that's not weird. Like, we should totally pay for that. And they did. <laughs> so anyway, um, the next one was, uh, we had we did gobs of this right where this un, this you know this gentleman had um, uh, prostate cancer and needed to have a, a, a prostatectomy and his urologist that in network urologist originally scheduled him at a facility for his prostatectomy that the in network allowed amount was going to be seventy five thousand dollars and literally like two miles down the highway um, at a, at another in network hospital with the same urologist like the urologist would do basically his surgeries at those two hospitals. Um, it was $25,000. It was a third of the cost. It was $50,000 less. 
And we're just like, look, I mean, you like Dr. Jones, you keep Dr. Jones, you don't have to switch from Dr. Jones, let's just switch the facility to a different hospital. And Dr. Jones is like, okay, that's fine. I mean, I can't do it on Tuesday there, but I can do it on Thursday. And so literally, and we did this, it was a relatively, um, it was a holding company uh, and the holding company had 150 employees and they were self-funded. So they were um, um, kind of smaller on the self-funded side, but they were the holding company for several like much larger companies. Like they had like a forklift company that had like 3000 employees. Um, and so the, the CFO of the holding company would joke around and be like, yeah, just that one surgery alone paid for Compass for like the next 30 years. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then lastly, uh, so that's an exit of uh, uh, an example of exit, right? So they just exited the system, right? They just ex exited that particular hospital. They're like, look, we're just getting out of here. Uh, optho was voice. And then gastroparesis was exit as well, because you just exited the, the existing gastroenterologist, right? We didn't try to up manage the gastroenterologist. We didn't complain to the gastroenterologist and try to get you know him or he or she to change their their treatment plan we're just like we're voting with our feet and we're going to go to a different provider you know sometimes you just got to walk away and you got to go somewhere else and then the last example is there was a gentleman who was an administrator of a um make sure you guys are doing okay you guys can still hear me okay write in the notes if you can um there was an administrator at a um, at a also at a community college who had unfortunately had to get a cardiac cath and stents, and he was getting balance billed by the hospital for fifteen thousand dollars incorrectly. And he was an older gentleman, and he was actually um, delaying his retirement because he thought he had to work longer to pay off this $15,000. And when we went back in, we identified um, the error that the hospital had been making. They basically had not been writing off the, um, the discount from the insurance company correctly. And so that 15 grand should have been written off because it was just part of the, of the discount for being you know, part of, you know, in network with the insurance company. And like, he was able to retire sooner. So like these things literally, it was, it was a huge deal. I mean, he'd been working for years and he was like delaying his retirement by like over a year so he could pay off this extra $15,000. And so it's a huge ramification, huge financial ramifications here. Like it's not just, healthcare is not just like quote unquote expensive. I mean, it, it dramatically impacts people's lives. He had bought like 20 acres out in the country and he was going to put a single wide trailer on it for him and his wife. Like that was his retirement dream was to live in a single wide trailer out in the country. And he, he had been delaying that because of this uh, $15,000 bill. Okay. So that's an exit of voice, right? We didn't just, you can't just walk away from that bill, right? So we had to, um, we had to use our voice to correct it.